All right, we're live. Awesome. Welcome everybody to the another virtual lecture. Here we're with Dr. Jennifer Goldback, and she's going to be talking about social media. Uh, and to introduce her, uh, we have Bethany here, and she's going to tell you a little bit about Jennifer before she gets started. Thank you. All right, I'll just keep my introduction for Jen brief. Um, Jennifer Goldback is the director of Human Computer Interaction Lab and an associate professor in the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland, College Park. She is a research fellow of the Web Science Research Initiative, and in 2006, she was selected as one of the IEE's Intelligent Systems Top 10 to watch, a list of their top young AI researchers. She received an AB in Economics and an SB in SM in, the commu in Computer Science at the University of Chicago, and a PhD in Computer Science from the University of Maryland. She is her, her research focuses on analyzing and computing with social media. This includes building models of social relationships, particularly trust, as well as user preferences and attributes, and using the results to design and build systems that improve the way people interact with, with information online. So please, um, let me introduce Jen. I need to update that bio with that 2006 thing in there make it a little more current. Um, yeah, so I'm Jen Goldbeck. I'm super happy to be here to talk to you guys today, um, even though it's a little virtual. And, uh, you know, we hear a lot about this term big data now, and I think I do big data research, but I like to call it big social data uh, because I am particularly interested in all the information that we share online. And if you look at sites like Facebook, so how many of you have Facebook accounts? pretty much everybody. Yeah, that's good. Um, I don't critique you if you don't have one. I'd kind of like to not have one myself sometimes, but you know, I have to keep it for my job. Um, but the vast majority of the planet is on Facebook if they have access to the internet. They have about 1.6 billion users, uh, which is crazy. There's about 2.2 billion people who have internet access, so more than half of them have Facebook accounts. And you combine that with Twitter and LinkedIn and all of these other social media sites and you have a huge amount of information for like the majority of the people on the world who are online. And there's some really powerful things that we can do with that. Um, so as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a computer scientist, and so I love kind of playing with this data. And a few years ago, we got this idea to start looking at what we could find out about people by analyzing what they put online. So I had originally been interested in the idea of discovering how much two strangers might trust each other online by looking at the intermediate people they know. So I ask my friends and they ask their friends and eventually we find somebody who knows you and I come up with a guess of how much to trust you. That's what I wrote my dissertation on about 10 years ago. And that was interesting, but we sort of expected everyone would tell us how much they trusted their friends. This totally seemed in 2005 like the kind of thing people would do. But you just rate all of your friends on Facebook or MySpace at the time. And nobody does that, right? You don't rate the trustworthiness of your friends. And so all this work that a lot of us were doing relied on knowing that, and we don't have that data. And so I started thinking, well, you know, if you think about how much people trust each other, a lot of it just depends on the person, right? So I'm self-aware enough to know that, like, I am overly trusting, right? Like, I trust people who I totally shouldn't, and I get myself into trouble like that all the time. Uh, I just happen to be a very trusting person. But, you know, I look at, like, my mom, and she's, like, super cynical of everything, right? And she doesn't trust anyone. And that doesn't have anything to do with the people we come into contact with. It has to do with us. And so I thought, you know, maybe we can do a better job understanding trust if we understand more about the people. And it turned out that understanding more about the people was so interesting that I kind of abandoned the trust stuff and have never come back to it. It's on my to-do list, but it's been there for like five years now, so you know who knows if we'll get back there. Uh, and so what, what I started off with is wanting to look at people's personality traits and figure out what those were by analyzing their Facebook profiles. So have you guys done like a Myers-Briggs personality test? That's like the four letters, like the INTJ. Have some of you done that? So I, I love taking these personality tests, and there's two of these. There's two widely accepted personality tests. One is that Myers-Briggs, the four letters, and the other one's called the Big Five, and it's similar. It has five personality attributes. Um, 
extroversion versus introversion. So I am a big introvert, though I like talking to people. I get really tired by the end of it. Um, whether you're open to new experiences, how conscientious you are, how agreeable you are, and neuroticism, which is the best one of those five, which sort of deals with emotional stability. So people who are anxious or angry or high on the neuroticism scale. So it's similar to Myers-Briggs, but it's free to administer the Big Five personality test, and you have to pay to administer Myers-Briggs, and so we used the Big Five. And we just grabbed whatever information we could from people's Facebook profiles. And it turned out that we could feed that all into some complex algorithms and guess people's personality scores within about 10% of the values that they would get if they took a personality test. Um, and that's very good. That's how much you might vary from week to week, depending on the mood you're in when you take the test. So that was kind of the first thing in this space of analyzing kind of hidden attributes about people, right? Things that you're not explicitly stating online. And since then, this has kind of exploded into a research area. So there was some additional work that just came out that shows you can find out people's personality traits just by looking at their likes on Facebook. You don't have to look at anything except their likes. Uh, there's similar research that shows you can infer people's political preferences, their personality traits, like I mentioned, their sexual orientation, their gender, their religion. Uh, some of it gets into even more obscure and surprising things, like whether people use drugs or smoke or use alcohol, and even if their parents got divorced before they were 21, which is one that still kind of blows me away every time I think about it, that that somehow reveals itself. And, you know, when I tell people about this, a lot of times they're like, well, that's not super surprising, right? Because you think about what we put on Facebook, and if you go to Facebook and you like the page, say, for the GOP, and then I guess that you're a conservative, like, that's not super impressive, right? I'm basically just looking at things you've explicitly said and telling you that that's a trait that you have. But it turns out if we get into these algorithms and actually look at what are the things that we do that are strong predictors of the traits we're interested in, they don't have any real connection that makes sense to humans. And my favorite example of that is uh, predicting people's intelligence scores. So there's this beautiful study out of Cambridge University where they looked at 65,000 people on Facebook and they predicted a bunch of these things that I just talked about. And they also had people take a standard like IQ style intelligence test and they wanted to see if they could guess their score on that intelligence test just by analyzing their likes on Facebook. And in their paper, they reported the likes that were most indicative of high and low intelligence. And so you can, we'll go through them, and you can tell me if you think they are kind of obvious indicators of someone who's smart. So in no particular order, the four most predictive Facebook likes for high intelligence were science. So you could say, like, science, smart people do science, right? So maybe that means you're smart. Um, thunderstorms, which is a little less obvious. Um, you could say maybe thunderstorms are kind of geeky thing to be into, and so maybe it's smart people who like that. The Colbert Report, uh, which was great. The Colbert Report actually covered this research study when it came out, since it linked them with high intelligence. And number four out of those is liking the Facebook page for curly fries. Um, and I love to talk about this example because it doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, curly fries are great but they're enjoyed by people of all intelligence levels. And so why is it that curly fries are a strong predictor of high intelligence? And incidentally, the strongest predictor for low intelligence was the Facebook page called I Love Being a Mom. Uh, and <laughs> that's where I'm like, it's not my research, right? The moms always get very upset when I share that. Um, you know, I have a 14-year-old stepdaughter as of July. I got married in July. And... Uh, it's real hard, so I don't know. Like maybe if you enjoy this, it does say something about your intelligence level. Because I don't know. I remember when I was 14, and it's even worse as an adult. Um, but really, liking motherhood does not mean you're stupid, and liking curly fries does not mean that you're smart. So why is it that these likes are so strongly predictive of those attributes? And it turns out that the computing that goes on in the background isn't looking for connections in the content, right? They don't look at curly fries and figure out what that means and then look at intelligence and figure out what that means and see if they fit together. They just look for statistical patterns. 
And so the story that I can tell about that would be, you know, imagine that the guy who made the curly fries page or one of the first people to like it happened to be someone who is smart. And so he likes the page and his friends see that. And we know in sociology there's this principle called homophily, um, which is a fancy term for saying that we're friends with people who are similar to us. So if you're rich, you tend to be friends with rich people. If you're young, you're friends with young people. Um, if you're white, you're friends with white people. If you're Jewish, you're friends with Jewish people. And it's not that all of your friends are like that, but rather your friends tend to have your traits more often than the general population did if we just randomly selected people in the world to be your friends. And so smart people tend to be friends with other smart people. So this guy who makes the Curly Fries page likes it. His friends see that he liked it. And he happens to have a lot of smart friends, which is something we expect from social science. And so those friends, some of them are like, yes, Curly Fries are great. And they like the page. And their friends see it. But they're also more likely to have smart friends. And we also know that you can track the way that likes like this spread through Facebook, along with viral videos and rumors and fads and links. They spread in the same way that diseases spread through offline social networks. So we can actually take models that like the CDC developed to track the spread of HIV or the flu, and we can just stick that on Facebook with the connections that people have with their friends and track the way that things spread through Facebook social network. And so basically you have this like of curly fries spreading like a virus through the Facebook social network but among people who happen to be smart. So at the end if you come along and you like the curly fries page on Facebook, the computer guesses you're smart not because curly fries have anything to do with intelligence, but because the attributes of other people who have done that action, right, who have liked that page, their attributes are reflected back on you. The computer says, lots of smart people have done this, they've liked this, so we're going to guess you're also smart, because you do things that smart people do. And it's probably the same story for the I love being a mom page, except you probably had someone who just happened to score low on the intelligence test create that page or like it early on, and it spread through a part of the network that happened to be low scoring. And social media is not the only place we see this. So my favorite example comes from Target. Uh, and there was this beautiful article in the New York Times a couple years ago. And it starts off with this great story of this dad in Minnesota. And he calls up his local Target. And he's like raging at the manager. You sent my 15-year-old daughter this flyer. It has coupons for diapers and baby bottles and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? She's a junior in high school. He's like enraged. The manager of the Target has no idea what he's talking about, because it turns out those flyers get sent like from Target headquarters. But the manager apologizes, and in like a majorly good customer service move, two weeks later, the manager of the store calls the dad back just to make sure everything's OK. And the dad says, you know, I owe you an apology, because it turns out my 15-year-old is pregnant, but Target figured it out before she told us, which is like such a great story. So how is it possible that Target knows a 15-year-old is pregnant before she has told literally anyone? Um, so let me ask you guys, if, you, if this were your job, right, you work for Target and they said find out when people are pregnant and the data that you have access to isn't social media but you have everybody's purchase history, right, everything they've bought that you track either through like one of those cards you scan when you check out or through using the same credit card. What's the purchase that you think would be a good indicator of somebody who's pregnant? Did I hear pregnancy test? Yeah. That's yeah, that's like the Family Feud answer, right? If we were playing Family Feud, you would win. Everybody <laughs> says pregnancy test. That's the number one answer. Um, but, you know, I like to say I have bought a few pregnancy tests in my day, and I only have a stepdaughter, right? I don't have any kids of my own. Um, you know, people buy them on both ways, even when they're not pregnant. So they, the New York Times interviewed a guy who worked for Target, and this guy said, you know, we compute what we call a pregnancy score, for every woman who shops at Target. So not only can we figure out if they're pregnant or not, they can actually pinpoint your due date very closely. And they do this by analyzing your purchases. And it's not something obvious like a pregnancy test. He said, you know, the things that are most indicative of a woman who's pregnant is that she buys an extra bottle of vitamins, she buys a purse that's big enough to double as a diaper bag. So not an actual diaper bag, just a really big purse. Um, and brightly colored rugs. 
And so I say, you know, like if you're in, in line at Target and the woman in front of you has like vitamins, a purse, and a blue rug, you don't go, oh, she's totally pregnant, right? Like that's not the thought that you have because these connections are statistical. They're things that the computer can rely on, but no human would think that they're revealing their secret pregnancy uh, by buying a purse and a rug and a bottle of vitamins. And Target's able to figure this out because it's very easy to tell from purchases when someone has had a baby. Right? How many of you have had kids? Are there any mothers in the room? Fathers? Okay, you started buying totally different stuff when that kid was born, right? Stuff that you had never bought before you had the baby. Like you buy a lot of diapers for one, right? And there's probably not a need for those before you have the kid. Um, so Target can say, let's find all the women who suddenly start buying diapers. And then let's go back nine months before that and see when we start seeing patterns emerge. So it's not that there is, there's nothing suspicious about buying vitamins and purses and rugs, but it turns out that that combination is very rare among the general population and not so rare among women who are pregnant. And so it's just these statistics that these three things, nobody tends to buy those things together except for this one group. And so if you buy them together, we guess you're in that one group. And I like these stories, the curly fries and, and the target example, because they show an important part of all this research that I'm talking about, which is that you can't hide from these algorithms. Uh, the algorithms will find things out about you because there's no way that you can know, you know, if I like this page or I buy this thing or this combination of things, you don't know what that's going to reveal about you. Because no one would guess that if they like the curly fries page, it means they're smart. Or if they buy the vitamins in the rug, that it means they're pregnant. They're kind of unintuitive for humans, and that makes it hard for humans to avoid having these things inferred about them. And it's not just that we can find out things that are true about you now. We can find out things that you don't know about yourself but are going to happen. So Cornell did this study where they wanted to look at your social network on Facebook. So just your list of friends and which of them liked each other. And guess which of those people was your significant other. So your spouse or the person you had said you're in a relationship with on Facebook. And if you think about like, okay, what's the thing that we're going to look at? Like what's the statistic we want to look at that's going to help us guess, you know, who my husband is on Facebook? The family feud answer to that is who do I have the most friends in common with? Right? Which one of my friends knows the most people? And that's, that's where they started off, and that's not a bad answer. And it, it turns out it is pretty predictive. But these researchers took it a step further. And if you think about your Facebook networks, and this is definitely true of me, you tend to have a bunch of separate social circles. So I have, like, my high school friends. I've got my family members, and I grew up in this little town in northern Illinois. Um, so, you know, they don't know anybody and the only link between my high school friends and my family is my brother and sister-in-law so they know like all 30 of my cousins and my high school friends know each other but my brother and sister-in-law went to high school with me so they know people in both circles all my other circles are pretty much separate I have like my hockey team thankfully they don't know anybody else because they're all kind of crazy uh, I got my you know a group of internet friends who I met online and we kind of talk on a forum I've got undergrad friends, I've got colleagues, people that I work with now, and these are all very distinct social circles. The researchers at Cornell said, you know, we're going to guess that your spouse is the person who's connected to the greatest number of those circles. So you may not have lots of friends in common, but that your spouse knows, you know, one or two of your family members and maybe somebody you went to high school with and a couple of your coworkers. And so it's not that they have to know all your friends, but that they know people from all these different parts of your life. And I say, like, my husband and I play on the same hockey team, right? So he knows all my hockey friends. But if those were the only people he knew, right, he did, I was like, you, you can't meet my family or my high school friends or my coworkers or anybody else, right? Just stay to the hockey team. Like, that would not be a good sign, especially if I've got another friend who knows people from all of my life. So this turned out to be a very good guess. Um, they're right about 75% of the time as to who your significant other is when they use this measure. But they were curious about the 25 percent of the time they're wrong. So they went back to Facebook two months after they ran this study and they looked at all the people they were wrong about. And it turns out if they guessed wrong that two months later you were 50 percent more likely to have broken up than if they guessed right. So essentially they made an algorithm that predicts whether or not your romantic relationship is going to last. Uh, 
by looking at how well people are connected in your social circles, which is pretty interesting. They know this before you know it because they can predict it you know, while you're in the relationship. One of my favorite studies in this space um, looks at predicting postpartum depression and this is a study on Twitter. They analyze posts that women make before they're pregnant and during their pregnancy and before the women give birth they can predict with 75 percent accuracy whether the woman will suffer from postpartum depression or not. And if you can take a week or so after she's given birth their accuracy goes up to over 80 percent. And that's pretty impressive. You don't even have to have the kid. They can tell before you give birth whether you're going to develop this. And there's similar research coming out that can predict de regular depression, not postpartum depression, standard depression, um, risks for diabetes, risks for developing obesity, risks for developing heart disease. And there's a lot of research focusing on this space of can we predict the likelihood that you're going to develop one of these health conditions because that gives you the opportunity to start some interventions or to talk to your doctor and kind of work on it. So there's a lot of promise in that space. But all these things that I've talked about rely on us having access to a lot of your data. Right? We need lots of people's data and we need a decent amount of data for each person to do that. And so the question is, can you avoid that? Can you kind of hide your data? And you know, the fact is that there's a ton of it out there, even when you don't think so. Um, so I'm going to, let's see if we can technologically do this. I'm going to try to show you guys a video here. Um, we didn't test this before, but let's see if it works. All right, can you see that? It looks like a little video guy. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk over this for a second, and then I'll show you the video. Um, so this is a thing called Take This Lollipop, which is a kind of interactive movie that uses stuff from your Facebook profile. And when this first came out, I said, you know, I'm not even going to bother trying it because I have, like, the world's strictest Facebook privacy settings. I have, like, everything is limited to this small group of my friends. Um, I've got the box check that, checked that says apps can't access my data. It won't get anything, so I'm not going to bother. And it got a lot of buzz, and so, you know, it's my job to know about this stuff. So I went and I tried it, and it made this video. So I'm going to show you the video. It's just like a minute and a half, and then I'll come back and talk to you, and I'll, I'll talk over it a bit. Hopefully that will work. All right, can you still see it? Yeah. Yes, I, ca I can't see you, so I need verbal confirmation that it's working. Yeah, I can't see it. Okay, uh, let's see if I can play it. And there should be sound in a second. Okay. All right, so this is, I click the connect with Facebook thing, that's how you log in. We're not seeing this part, it's still showing the same screen. Oh, let's see, let's try it down here. So this you can see. Yep. Yeah. All right, let's see if we can show it this way. Is it moving now? Yes. Yes, okay, good. So this won't be quite as nice. Can you hear the sound? No. Let's see if I can get it through to you here. Now we can kind of hear something, but I think it's coming through your mic. Well, maybe I can get closer to it and play it that way. Can you hear a little bit now? It sounds not super critical. A little bit. So I'll sort of narrate as this is going along. So you obviously have this creepy guy here. It's showing all the posts that my friends have made, all their likes, uh, all their comments on everything. It can access all my pictures, which I thought were totally private. More photos there. So here's putting in my current location. You can see it's got my friend list along the side, like it's showing everything from my profile.
And you can see there's my profile on the dashboard. All right, and then underneath it says, Brian King is next. It, like, picks one of your friends from the list. Okay, so, so there's the video. You can make one of these videos of yourself if you go to takethislollipop.com. Uh, it's totally secure. What it shows is all the data that any app on Facebook can access from your profile, which is, like, everything. I, I thought it couldn't get anything about me, and it got everything I just showed you. I, with all of my privacy settings set high. And, like, it's my job to be the world's expert on Facebook privacy settings. And I was completely wrong about what this could access. So, like, if I can't figure it out, no one can actually be expected to figure it out, right? Because I spend all my time studying privacy settings. And so I think that this is really interesting because I tried very hard in my settings and was kind of operating on the assumption that, external applications could not access my data, but it turns out that that's not true, that all of my preferences get overridden whenever I install something. And in fact, on Facebook, even if you decide not to install anything, if your Facebook friends install an application, that application can access your data as well. And so even if you try to take all these measures to protect yourself, if your friends aren't as careful, your data is still getting shared. So there's this huge amount of information about you out there, even though you might be trying to keep it private. So if you combine that, all this data leaking out, even when we don't want to share it, with the fact that we're able to then take that data and do all kinds of different analysis on it in ways that humans don't really understand, right? It's like the computer does these complex things that we can't explain. Suddenly, it becomes hard to reason about where your data is going to end up and what people are going to do with it. Right now, it tends to be used mostly for advertising, maybe to recommend things to you. So, you know, Amazon will recommend products or Netflix will recommend shows that they might want you to see. But imagine if this kind of data were used by, say, insurance companies to determine what insurance rates you're going to get, whether you're eligible for coverage. So if it shows that you're at risk for heart disease and diabetes and obesity, Maybe you end up paying more for your insurance. Um, what if you lie about smoking and the algorithm says that you do smoke? Are you going to get charged a smoker's rate for your insurance? What if it's used in decisions about whether or not you should get a loan? I have people from credit bureaus call me to ask me help them integrate social media into the credit reports that they're offering. So it's something they're already thinking about. Um, what about hiring? What if your social media profile, I mean, what you have on social media is already used to determine if you're hireable. And I just wrote a book that's out, you know, this week that talks about how that works. But what if we start using these inferred things? Um, we are able to infer how well you work in teams, how likely you are to stay at your job. We can compute all of that. What if that's something that companies start using? I have an email waiting in my inbox from a startup that's doing exactly that. They want to buy me coffee next week so I can talk to them about generating reports that they can sell about people by analyzing their social media and finding these hidden kind of secret things that we don't want to share. Um, suddenly you start to think there are real world impacts from this. It's not just an online problem. And you can carry that further. One, one of the things we're able to infer most accurately is sexual orientation. There are a lot of different ways to do it, um, including if you don't say anything. That's one of those things where your friends reveal enough information that we can just look at them and guess it. So we can guess that quite accurately. Um, there are companies in the U.S. that you might work for that you wouldn't want knowing your sexual orientation if you're gay. And there are countries that you can live in, Facebook is international, where you can be arrested and potentially put to death if they find out that you're gay. What happens if those people start using these algorithms? There's a lot of concern there. Um, I don't have a great solution for it. We could hope that there would be a legislative solution that, you know, maybe Congress will come around and give us some rights to control this data because we don't have those rights now. But the Congress kind of hasn't caught up to the fact that the Internet exists, right? So it's unlikely that they're suddenly going to understand this pretty complicated technology that goes with social media. On the other hand, in Europe, 
people have a lot of protections that we don't have here. In Europe, data about you is considered your property, and so you have control over how that data is used. Companies like Facebook cannot take your data in Europe and use it for whatever they want. And this is why you hear a lot about lawsuits against Google and Facebook taking place in Spain and Germany and elsewhere in Europe that is designed to protect people's privacy because European law says you own data that's about you. In the US that's not the case. In the US when you share data with a third party like you post it up to Facebook, that data becomes Facebook's property and they can do whatever they want with it. So we don't have those rights to protect ourselves. We don't have the ability to control who has access to our data here, um, which is sort of troubling. And as these technologies become more commercially available, it's going to become a lot more concerning. Uh, I think in three to five years, any of this is technology that you'll be able to just go to a website and download. And that's starting to already happen. Uh, there was a news release this week for an email program that uses social media to analyze the personality traits of the people you are emailing, and it tells you how to have a good conversation with them. So, you know, get to the point quickly. Don't include a lot of pleasantries with this person. Uh, addr address a lot of points in one email so you don't bother them. Where other people, it might say, you know, make sure you have some kind of personal opening and only include one point in each, in each message because they won't get past the first one. You can download that technology right now. That became available this week. It's a harbinger for what's coming. And so I'm just going to kind of leave you guys with the c considering what you want out of this. I think that that the technology is concerning, but nothing's going to happen unless we start doing something about it. I think on the legal perspective, it's probably going to be things like class action lawsuits and other kind of user-originated legal processes that start to make some changes where it just becomes expensive for Google and Facebook uh, to share our data in ways that we don't want. But I don't have any great solutions beyond that. My job at this point I think of as sort of evangelist for explaining the technology because I think a lot of us don't understand just how much we can do with all this data that's out there. Um, and if it's something that's concerning to you, there's lots of organizations that you can talk to who are interested in privacy and transparency and data ownership that you can talk to. If you want to try some of these technologies on yourself, um, you can do that. So if you Google me, I write a blog for Psychology Today and I posted something last week that has a list of all the sites you can go to that will analyze your Twitter profile or your Facebook profile and show you all the predictions. Um, so that includes um, the personality traits, it includes intelligence like with the curly fries, all of those attributes are there. Um, so there's five or six different tools that you can use and you can see what these algorithms are finding out about you now. Uh, and I think that's about it. So we said we were going to leave some time for questions. And uh, so that hopefully was slightly entertaining and slightly creepy. And, uh, and if there's things that I can tell you guys now, uh, I'd be happy to. We'll hand out the tinfoil for your hats afterwards. Okay? <laughs> and, and I will apologize at this pause if you can hear my puppy barking in the background. Like, she gets very upset at leaves blowing and whatever, and something is happening outside. <laughs> Kayla. Yeah. Um, have you heard about Europe's um, right to be forgotten? Do you think that it'll ever be adopted in the United States? Uh, yeah, so the right to be forgotten is this, uh, this lawsuit that I think was based in Spain, um, where a guy, I think he had like defaulted on a loan or something, and it was one of these financial things, and if you Googled him, it was one of the first things that came up. And, you know, we have these we have laws here in the US and they certainly exist in Europe that says you know if you default on a loan or whatever it uh, disappears after your off of your credit report after a certain number of years and he was basically making the argument that look you know it's been 10 years since this thing happened they're not allowed to have it on my credit report anymore yet it's the first thing that comes up on Google so essentially I can't get a job like I, people search for me and I show up as this delinquent I want Google to delete that and and the court said, yes, Google has to delete that. And so Google is trying to implement this, but it's such a hard process, which is you know, the, the challenging thing with all these technologies. Um, you can fill out a form, and if you say, you, know, you live in Europe, here's the page that you want removed, uh, and you give a little explanation, and it gets sent off in, into Google somewhere, and like, who knows what happens with it. Uh, there's no way to track it. You don't get a response. I've tried it, and you just kind of send it, and it goes. 
I don't know how well that's going to work. Like, on one hand, I totally agree with the argument that this guy made that we don't want stuff floating around. You know, if you Google me, there's a ton of stuff about me online now. But, like, probably the last search result is something that I actually didn't post, but somebody... I had left a dorm computer in 1995 logged in when I was, like, a first year in college, and somebody posted something on, like, some vampire website under my username. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't even write it. And, I mean, it's nothing super embarrassing, except it's, like, really lame 90s vampire stuff, right? And it <laughs> used to be, like, there was nothing about me online, and that, that would totally come up. And it'd be great if I could be like, hey, like, please take this away, <laughs> right? Um... So I, I understand the need for this to happen. On the other hand, there is this kind of anti-transparency thing that comes with it where you can have politicians wanting anything bad that they've ever done expunged from the web, right, and to kind of hide it from potential voters, um, which seems really problematic. And how do you draw this distinction between public figures and private figures and what will be deleted and what won't? I think, you know, we have to kind of do a wait and see about how it's going to work in Europe. Um, I, just the volume of requests that I suspect they would get makes it hard to deal with and like making decisions about what to take down is hard to deal with if it works, if they find a way to make it work in Europe we might see it here but it's not something that I expect to show up you know, without some kind of legal process in the US I don't think they'll voluntarily release it here for quite a long time, if at all is, Do you think this is an issue with Google and other search engines? Or is this should be something taken up with the site that actually has the information? Well, I mean, if you really want something down, you will have better luck with the site that has the information. Um, because it's just very... I'm sympathetic to Google in this case because it is just very hard to pull something out of your database like that, to say, I'm not going to... You know, do you not index that page at all? You know, so say it's a list of people who have defaulted on their loans. Some of that may be current and some of it may be old. Do you just ignore the page altogether? Do you remove the information just about the person, the single person who's requested it? You know, how you handle that's really hard. And for Google, you know, they just basically crawl everything that they can get and dump it into their database. And now suddenly having to make judgments about what pages to include and what not to, that's really hard. Um, and I think here in, in the U.S., the only success you're going to have is if the only way you can get something taken out of Google is if you own the page and you tell Google, you know, you shouldn't have been indexing it and you ignored, you know, this command that says not to look at my page um, and I need you to take it out. If there's information about you, Google doesn't care if you're in the U.S. and they're not going to take it down. And so you'll have better luck trying to contact a page owner. But, you know, they're often not interested in, you know, handling all of these individual users' complaints about the data they have. So once stuff gets out there, you're kind of stuck with it. And then on top of that, you have this issue of Internet archiving. So how many of you use the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine? Oh, all right, it's the best thing ever. Like, one of my favorite websites. You can go to archive.org, and they have this thing called the Wayback Machine, which is just a... you put in a URL, so you could do, like, cnn.com. And they have been archiving everything online since 1998. And so you could, for CNN, they have like multiple versions every day of what was on CNN. But even for, you know, like I look at like my personal websites, right? Like I went to the University of Chicago as an undergrad and I've had pages there, you know, since 1997, I think. And they're all in there, like my little pages. They're not indexed as often as CNN, but you can find like Jen Goldbeck's 1998 website at the University of Chicago. So you can put in any URL and see archived versions of it. So even if Google were to take something out of their search results, even if the page that had the data were to take it down, there's also archives of it, right? There's archived versions of that page. So you have all that data in a lot of different places all of a sudden if you're trying to really get rid of it. And, and of course, that doesn't include databases where it might be stored and other kind of data brokers and aggregated places that have it. Other questions? Um, I have a question. What was, do you remember what was the first thing that got you interested in studying computer science or information science? Uh, interested in studying it? Yeah. Oh, uh, so I took a very unusual route through 
college. <laughs> I, so I don't recommend my strategy, but I'll tell you what it was, um, which is I started off, I, was, I think I was a political science major and changed to economics because I'm, I'm a very quantitative person and political science just wasn't like mathy enough for me. And I did my economics degree in the summer in between my third and fourth year of undergrad. I saw this movie called Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, which is an Errol Morris documentary about the kind of connections between things. And I literally, like, the final credits rolled, and I said, oh, my God, like, I want to be a computer scientist. Like, that's the way to study this. And so I changed my major. Like, I walked out of the movie and changed my major. Um, and I had one year left. And it's, Chicago is a weird university. Um, so their own quarters... And there's no such thing as like part-time or overloads. You can take three classes or four classes each quarter. And computer science required 12 classes. And if you do the math, like there's three quarters in the academic year. So I could take 12 classes my fourth year. So I took all the computer science degree my fourth year, um, which means I was taking classes in the fall that I would take the prerequisites for in the winter. Like it was very bad. I was summarily rejected from grad school because I applied with like one programming course with a C on my record. Um, I kind of enslaved myself to get a master's degree, which I did much better on, and uh, and then went to, to do my PhD, but I didn't really know at that point what I wanted to do. Like, computer science was interesting, um, and I liked programming, and I kind of had this interest. So University of Chicago is where the Freakonomics guys are from, and I had taken some of their classes, and the thing I liked most about economics was not the kind of study of markets and money, but the study of the kind of behavioral economics, right? What motivates people to do things and how do they do it? And so when I started trying to do research, I was kind of aggregating anything I thought was interesting to try to figure out what it was I wanted to do. So I had papers on like social insects, right? Like how do bees communicate? Like I had papers about that in this binder and I didn't want to be a biologist, but that was really cool and traffic patterns, I had stuff about that, and I had some economic stuff. And it kind of emerged that I was interested basically in, in what it turns out there's a field called... You're complex. breaking up on us. Oh, that means I'm talking too long. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was very roundabout, and I ended up studying people and how they interact, um, which you can do in a lot of different places. So I did it in computer science, but when I finished my PhD, uh, I came out, and that's a kind of border of computer science. And information science said, this is great, looking at people and how they interact, especially with technology. And so that's how I ended up there, and it's absolutely the best place for me. Like, I'm so happy in an information science school. Other questions? Don't be shy. How, in your research, how has uh, things like paid likes affected what you're looking at? Has it? Yeah, that's a great question. I uh, Facebook doesn't like me for some complex reasons, and so I've never worked directly with Facebook to get data, um, which is how the people who do these like studies do them. They work directly with Facebook. So uh, it hasn't affected me because I've worked with other data. Um, I mostly focus on Twitter at this point, and when I've worked with stuff on Facebook, it's been more kind of profile information and status updates rather than likes. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a good question for the research area in general with these fake likes or fake followers, which you get on Twitter and how those impact it. Um, so far, it seems like they've shake, shaken out sort of as noise that it hasn't mattered too much because we tend to study the real people and not the fake ones. Uh, but with the volume that they make up of likes and accounts at this point, there's a real question of if it's going to interfere with our ability to do this kind of research down the road. Um, do you study any other social media sites besides Facebook and Twitter? Uh, that's a good question. So I've done some on Pinterest, which is kind of interesting because Pinterest is very different from the other ones. Um, but we've looked at social network connections. So part, part of my work really focuses on um, what we call graph structure. So basically your social network, your friends and their connections to each other, that network. Um, so I've studied that in a bunch of places. Pinterest is one. We've looked at it at LinkedIn, uh, Slashdot, which is a kind of more of a kind of forum discussion thing. Um, Reddit is another one where it's kind of easy to get that social information. And then a lot of old blog sites. So LiveJournal is a great one 
which was like super popular in the late 90s and you know, there's still a lot of data around for it. Uh, but you know, the vast majority of users, especially in the US, are on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, Instagram is a great one, except we don't really know what to do with that data because computers sort of suck at dealing with pictures. Like we, computers don't know what a picture is of, and so it's, it's hard to do anything with that. Um, so pretty much all the research takes place on Facebook and Twitter. A little bit on LinkedIn, though LinkedIn is very protective of their data. Uh, and then you'll get some, you know, depending on what data people are looking at, some from these other sites, like I mentioned, like Pinterest. Other questions? Behind, behind you, Kayla. She had her hand up first. <laughs> I'm You're nice. sure that there are different places that you can move to like, consult to protect yourself, but are there any movements going on that will give people the right to protect themselves online? Not, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, not so much. There's not a real push for it at this point. And uh, you know, I don't think that means that there aren't people who want it. I, I think there's a lot of people who would want it. Uh, I think we don't see a big push for it at this point partially because people don't fully understand the problem yet. Uh, you know, so I, I, I kind of liken it to privacy settings, right? Like when I started talking about Facebook with students in 2007, that's when I started on the faculty, a lot of them didn't have any privacy settings turned on. They just had it with what it was, which was very public. And, you know, I'd say, you know, your mom can look at your Facebook profile and they'd like freak out, oh, that's such an invasion of my privacy. Like, she should never do that. I, I would never forgive my mom if she looked at my Facebook profile. You know, like not understanding that, hey, like, it's public so anyone can look at it. And it's really naive to just expect that privacy to be protected. And what we saw is that once enough people had suffered negative consequences, from being too public, getting fired, getting sued, getting arrested, then people started to be more concerned about their privacy settings and really kind of freak out when Facebook would change them. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just wrote this book uh, that came out this week. It's called Social Media Investigation. So it's basically how to look up stuff about people online. And I have stories from lawyers and, you know, people inside companies and uh, police departments. And people are still sharing all this crazy stuff online and getting fired and arrested and sued. But at least now we sort of, we kind of say like, man, they should have had better privacy settings or not posted that as opposed to saying, oh, you know, I can't believe anyone would access that data. I think then, you know, the next step, the stuff I talked to you about today is much more sophisticated. It's not like I'm just looking up what you posted online. I'm kind of figuring out stuff that you may have intentionally tried to keep private. But a lot of people don't really understand that and how it works. And so it makes it hard for them to say, I need protection from this thing because we don't really understand what that thing is. It's, it's very new and it's changing. And so I don't think you're going to really see a movement pushing for this kind of data protection until people start seeing the really negative consequences that come from that. You know, the research shows you basically have to have a personal incident, like, you know, for identity theft, for example, your identity needs to be stolen, or somebody that you know, right? So you really get to witness the implications of it. I think we're going to have to see that kind of thing, right? That, that this data is going to be used in ways people don't like, and it's going to be really shocking to us and really terrible. And then people are going to say, hey, this shouldn't be allowed to happen. We need some new protections. And I'm encouraged that that's possible at this point, um, you know, following on the whole net neutrality debate. Because I think all of us who were watching that last year, right, when the FCC basically, like, got their rules thrown out, it totally looked like net neutrality was going to go away, that they weren't going to step up. Um, they weren't going to find a way around the court ruling and that we would be out of luck. And it totally turned out that that didn't happen, that all of this public pressure actually gave us rules that protected us in a really awesome way. Um, that was kind of surprising to me, but also great. And so it makes me confident that once there is a big enough groundswell and demand for this kind of privacy, that we will be able to push in some way for some regulation to give it to us. Um, and that's part of why I like to talk about this, because I want people to be aware. And so when they start seeing some of these creepy things happen, they can kind of raise a flag and say, hey, that's a problem because of this data issue, and we need to work on that. So I think we will get there eventually, but I think it's going to take a while before people really feel it's personal and a threat to them, and they want some protection. 
Caitlin? That was my question, more or less. Oh, okay. Other questions? Do you think that education, like teaching people that if you post something on the internet, people, other people can see it? Because I have classmates who think that once they post something on Twitter, it's gone forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is really interesting. And, uh, you know, there's such great stories you can tell with this. So. Uh, I'm in Washington, D.C., and so I talk a lot with, like, federal law enforcement. Um, I, I go to the FBI and, and other organizations. And the last time I was in um, talking to these guys, you know, it's like a bunch of guys, and they're, like, 50s and 60s, and they're still actively investigating people. And, you know, the government has intelligence groups that will look at social media, but you don't go talk to them like if you're just kind of curious about, you know, this one guy that's not like a big investigation yet. You want to just be able to look them up yourselves. And these guys, they don't have Twitter accounts. They, you know, maybe have a Facebook account that someone set up with them. So they're not really comfortable with the technology. And I said, you know, let's look at the location feature on Twitter. So if you post from your phone, you can have it set so it posts your GPS location with your tweets. About 10% of people have that turned on. And so we went to, like, we searched for, like, broccoli or puppies, like some totally innocuous term, till we found somebody who had the location turned on, because you could see a little, like, icon, like, on a Google map next to the tweet. And we said, all right, like, let's investigate this guy, right? It was a closed room. It was a private session. So we pulled up this guy's account and I had, you know, there's a, there's some tools out there where you can plug in an account and it shows you where everything is. And we got this beautiful map of like, we could figure out where his house was. Um, he was attending community college and the GPS resolution, he was in like in upstate New York, was so good that we could find the classrooms in the community college where he had each of his classes. And we like looked at the tweets like, oh, and he's tweeting from this spot. It's, it's all about biology class. That's obviously his biology room. And like this one and the other side of the, you know, the building is where his English class is. And, you know, all the time he's posting from here, like, this is home. We figured out his class schedule. We figured out, like, where he likes to go for lunch uh, just by going through this, you know, very public data that he's posting. Um, so, I, you know, I think that that shows a lot of this, right, that there's, there's all of this stuff there. Um, so, I don't know. I've sort of lost the thread of your question there, but <laughs> I hope the example steered us towards it. Um, it was about, like, if we could teach, like, like Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Um, so, so I think this is an example, right? Like, I taught these guys who had never used this before, like, oh, man, there's so much out there, right? But, I, you know, I think this is sort of in response to the previous question where I said you need to make this personal. Um, I think if you want to teach people of any age how, what to be concerned about and how to use social media, you need to kind of make it personal for them. Right? You need to show them uh, something that they wouldn't expect from their data. So, you know, I, I mentioned that you guys can try all of these technologies out on yourselves. I don't know that that's the best way to teach the real risks of it because it's wrong sometimes, right? This is new, very new technology. Like, we, we've come up, we're still coming up with these algorithms. And so I think if people are like, oh, but it was wrong about X, Y, and Z, they sort of dismiss it. I think a better thing is to show, um, you know, so the example that I always want to do in class, because I teach a social network class, is to kind of pair people off and make them investigate each other. Give them a week to just find whatever they can about each other online. I haven't done it because I'm just afraid somebody's going to get angry and, like, complain to the administration about it, <laughs> and I, I don't want to get yelled at. They're now I have tenure, so maybe I should do it. But I think that's the kind of thing, right, that, that if you take people and be like, all right, like, let's go see what you're leaving out there and how it can be used. You know, bring in a, a family lawyer, right, like a divorce attorney, um, to explain how they would use the things they found about you online against you if you were in a divorce. Like that kind of stuff, because I think I was even sort of naive about this. You know, I was an expert witness in a case last summer, and, you know, there's nothing bad. I've never done anything bad. Like, so there's nothing bad to find about me. But I saw the lawyers that I worked with investigating the expert witnesses for the other side and just anything they could find they would use against them. And I saw the other side, like they had copies of my dissertation that they had read, like trying to find 
individual sentences that they could use to contradict things I was saying. And they certainly do that with stuff they can find online. And I was sort of shocked that, you know, you don't think that every record you've ever produced is going to be deeply analyzed to find something to use against you. But that absolutely happens depending on the situations you find yourself in on life. And so I think if we sort of show people like here's everything we can find about you and like oh you're not worried about that well let me just show you you know how somebody might twist that against you that kind of gets people thinking about it in a way that they might not have thought about it otherwise uh, that maybe will make them a little more concerned and protective. Uh, but not always. There's some people who just don't care. You know, and I talk to these people they're like the people can find out whatever they want about me and it's fine and they really are fine with it and and that's okay, but I think we should at least be kind of aware and sophisticated about um, our thought process when we share our data because there are a lot of ways that it could be used that we might not like. Good time for maybe one more. Anybody else got a last question? All right, I got one. Um, have you <laughs> ever worked with um, any uh, data companies and things like Axiom or anything like that in the data they collect? Yeah, I have not. Um, I, th I think I have a moral problem with some of those companies. Like, it just really creeps me out how much data they have on people and the fact that they're kind of selling this information about me to people that I don't necessarily want it shared with. Um, it's hard to get into those companies, right? I, I mean, I'm sure I could convince them to do a project with me if I let them do more sophisticated stuff, but uh, I, I don't really like the stuff that they do and, uh, you know, like my own research relies on getting access to data about people, but I say if I convince people to protect their data and I can't do my research anymore, that like that's a win and I'll start doing research on something else because I want people's data to be used in ways that they're okay with it. And, and so I think companies like Axiom, and, and this is not to pick on them in particular, just data brokers in general, um, they, don't, they don't have that same ethic, right? They don't care if they're using your data the way you want or not. They just care how much money they're going to get for it. And, and I find that sort of troubling. So I've never bothered reaching out to those companies because I would just feel kind of icky about using the information that they might give me. Uh, that said, a lot of people do work with them, and it'll be interesting, especially in the 2016 presidential elections. Um, we've seen in the last couple cycles, especially Obama's campaign, do really kind of amazing and effective things, combining data broker, like purchased information with public records and voter registration and other things. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how both sides use it in the next campaign. Uh, and I think now that they now that the media knows that that's happening, there's going to be more coverage of it, which will be interesting to see. How many people have heard of Axiom or another data broker company? Okay, a couple. Uh, would you mind ex explaining real quick kind of what they do? Yeah, uh, so very quickly, basically they collect data about you from every place they can get it, and they uh, build a profile of you, and they'll sell that data, say, to marketers. So you could come in, so I could say, you know, I'm selling um, orthopedic shoes. All right, so that's my company. So, uh, and I'm based in uh, Maryland, and so I just want to find, you know, people in Maryland who might be customers for me. So show me people who are, you know, say both genders in this age range with this amount of income, and you know maybe who have been to the doctor in the last six months and they'll give me a, a list of people with all their contact information so they have you know addresses and phone numbers and email addresses but they get stuff from credit reports they get you know they buy databases from lots of companies so when you sign up you know like at an e-commerce site a lot of times there'll be a clause in there about you know it, your data being shared with third parties that sometimes is these data brokers so they they say they have about 3,000 data points on every person in the US, um, which includes everything from your birthday and your address to really detailed personal information. It's hard to find out exactly what they have. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, there's a great book that came out a couple summers ago called Dragnet Nation, um, which is a journalist who is kind of trying to just follow all the data about her and kind of get opted out of it. And she does talk about the data brokers in there. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. You know, especially as data becomes more powerful with these new algorithms, how these companies that basically collect your data from free sources and then aggregate it together and sell it. Um, it'll be interesting to see, 
you know, what we start thinking about them as there's bigger implications of what they do. All right, well, it's, it's time. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, for speaking with us. Thank you, guys. And uh, we'll go ahead and sign off. Everybody have a nice day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.